I've been uh, plant-based for, I would say, 30 years. To be honest, more like 40 years, but the first 10 of those years was a, a slow transition. So, you know, gradually dropped red meat and then slowly, you know, just eating less and less of the animal products. And um, so it was, it, it's been 30 years that I can say I've been pretty much entirely plant-based. Um, I, that happened uh, after I became a dietitian. So I've been a dietitian for pff, 1982, I graduated, 1983. So, you know, uh, 35 years I've been a registered dietitian. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it, it happened after. And, and I can tell you, <laughs> it was not an easy decision because I had actually only met one real live vegetarian in my life. And it was my grade eight science teacher. And he was a hippie. He had the long hair, and I thought he was really cool. My dad taught in a classroom opposite him, and, and he thought it was just absolutely insane that he was eating a vegetarian diet and feeding it to his kids, of all things. So when I, you know, when I made the decision to become completely plant-based, uh, my family didn't exactly do a, you know, celebration party. <laughs> I had, at that time, I had a four-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son. So they were still very, very young. And, um, you know, what, what triggered it for me, I was actually, at the time, I was a, a community nutritionist. So my job was teaching Canada's food guide and the four food groups, two of the four of which were animal products. And, uh, and, and so, and I mean, I, I led a nursing moms group. I did, uh, you know, I, I often spoke on CBC on the radio. I did, yeah, I had a column in the newspaper. I just was doing a, a wide variety of things, but it was really based on the traditional teachings of my profession. And so the decision to make this extreme leap to a plant-based diet was a little, you know, it was a little concerning because I didn't know if you could be a dietitian and be plant-based. Um, but anyway, what triggered my um, change was I, I, I found myself shifting in a direction of more plant foods, fewer animal foods because of health. I thought it just made sense to me, fiber and, and all of the wonderful things you find in plants. And it made sense to be eating lentils and tofu instead of um, you know, red meat, and, and so I, I slowly was making that shift, but, but what actually was kind of the final straw was an interaction I had with um, my husband's best man at our wedding. He was on his way deer hunting, and uh, he called, and he said, can I stop by for coffee on my way deer hunting? And I said, sure, no problem, and and uh, so he, he, and as he's driving over, I'm thinking to myself, how can I make this man feel very guilty about killing another deer? Because I just, I didn't like the idea of hunting. And, and so when he was, when he was uh, visiting, I, I, I said to him, you know, I, I don't understand how you can feel good about, you know, going into the woods with your big gun and shooting a beautiful, innocent animal that to me doesn't deserve to die. What did that animal ever do to you? And, you know, you call it a sport, but it's like usually in sports, both teams have the same equipment. Uh, I, I don't consider it a sport. It's just, it just seems mean spirited. And, and it was what he said back to me that changed the course of my life. He said, you know, just because you don't have the guts to pull the trigger does not mean you're not responsible for the trigger being pulled every time you buy your piece of meat camouflaged in cellophane in the grocery store. He said, at least the animals I eat have had a life. I wonder if you can say the same for the ones that are sitting on your plate. And it, he just, I was silenced. I was absolutely silenced because I knew um, that he was right. And I had never taken responsibility for the food that I was putting in my mouth. Uh, and, and you go to the grocery store and it's so simple. Uh, and we, we don't look beyond that and, and really understand where our food is coming from. And so after that interaction, I really thought about it and I started researching how 
we're raising animals and, and what's involved. And what I learned filled me with uh, shame, guilt, remorse. Uh, you know, I was raised as a little kid, I can still remember um, picking worms off the sidewalk for fear they were going to, you know, dry up after the rain. I, I used to talk to animals on my way to school. I, d I, I had a big heart for animals. I can remember being at a bullfight when I was about three years old and, you know, it was El Cordobes, the hero of Spain, and we are there. And, and all of a sudden I realized what a bullfight was, that we're, they were going to kill this bull. And, and when the bull scored a couple of points or whatever he did, I jumped up on my seat. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop in the entire stadium of 10,000 people. There's this little three-year-old jumping up and down, yay, bull, go, bull, you know? And so I always had that heart, as I think many children do, but we get desensitized as we grow up and we get removed from our, you know, where the food is really coming from. And, and so I made a decision at that point, and I thought to myself, I don't want my life to be about contributing to pain, suffering, and death any more than it has to be. I don't need to be a part of this system of cruelty. And, you know, my mom grew up on a farm, and they had names for the animals, and the animals did have a bit of a life until they went to the slaughterhouse or they were killed at the farm, whichever it was. But today, animals don't have a life. They're, you know, 90% are raised in CAFOs, confined animal feeding operation. And they, I mean, literally, when you think about the, you know, the pig, for example, they, you know, pigs have been rated to have the intelligence of a three-year-old child and dogs about a two-and-a-half-year-old child. And they, they are um, very uh, intelligent beings. And yet these pigs that would live 15 years uh, live six months in, in a prison, in a hellish prison that's so bad that they go insane they, you know, so in order to prevent them from biting one another's tails off in that little stall, they, you know, they, they cut their, you know, tails off and they cut their ears, they dock their ears, they cut their genitals off so they don't have as many hormones going on. And all without any anesthetic when they're just little babies. It's just horrendous what we do to these creatures. And I can't justify it. I don't understand how the human race is justifying it. The only thing I can think of is that people have these blinders on because they're just buying this piece of meat at the grocery store. And it's got to stop. It, we're killing ourselves by, by eating animals that are you know, raised in, in this way. We're eating so much of it and we're destroying the planet and we're you know, causing um, unthinkable suffering in these creatures for nothing. It's, totally unnecessary. And so when I came to that realization, even as a dietitian, I thought, I, I just, I can't do this. And so I, I went to my husband of about 10 years at that time. We'd been married about 10 years. And I said to him, I'm, would you be willing to become a vegetarian? Well, he'd never even met a real live vegetarian. I mean, he, you know, he didn't have the same science teacher I did. And, um, and he said, um, I thought you'd never ask. I'd love to be a vegetarian. He said, I've always wanted to live a lifestyle that would leave a softer footprint on the planet. And I can't think of a better way of doing that. So I thought to myself, boy, I married pretty young, but I married pretty well. So it, it, it worked out uh, very nicely. Well, I can tell you that the dietetic profession 30 years ago, I'll, I'll even go a step further back. When I was in university, uh, and again, this was in the late 70s, early 80s, um, I learned two things about vegetarian nutrition in school. One was that vegetarian diets were risky and should never be fed to children or pregnant or lactating women. And vegan diets were downright dangerous. Nobody should be eating them, period. That's pretty much all I learned. So you can imagine five or six years later in practice, uh, the, the, you know, the, the sentiment hadn't shifted uh, a, a lot. Uh, so the idea of a dietitian being not only you know, vegetarian, but pretty much vegan was almost unheard of. As a matter of fact, I didn't know if I was the only vegan dietitian on the planet. 
Uh, and it was scary. I, I, I thought I might be ousted from the profession. Um, but I, and, and I considered, um, you know, another profession. I, I thought, do I need to leave? But I thought, you know, if everybody who starts to see a bigger picture, the, the ethical picture, the environmental picture, um, the, you know, even the recommendations of the World Health Organization at the time, that, that a lot of North Americans weren't very familiar with, if, if, if everybody who started to see these things just exited the profession, I thought, we'll never, it will take much longer to affect change within the profession. I thought, I've, I've got to have the courage to stay and to speak um, with some uh, knowledge, and I, may, I need to make sure that I am very, very well versed with the literature. I need to be very professional in what I do, and I, I just need to stay. And I wanted so desperately to help people who were choosing uh, a plant-based diet to do it well. I thought, I, I know enough from my education that I can help people to design diets that work really well. Because to me, a failed vegetarian or a failed vegan is really exhibit number one for why everybody around them is justified in eating meat. They kind of prove you need meat to be healthy. And, and so I, I was really determined to try to help change that. And when I moved to, you know, within a year or two of becoming uh, plant-based, I, I moved to Vancouver from Northern Ontario. Northern Ontario is kind of hunting, fishing, beer and bingo kind of crowd. And no, wonderful people, don't get me wrong, just uh, wonderful, wonderful people. But, but ha that more of that mentality, whereas Vancouver, much more veg friendly. I thought I'm gonna meet real live vegetarians for the first time in my life. <laughs> so we moved there and you wouldn't believe uh, the first few dietitians I met, I met two. One was moving towards plant-based, the other one was a Seventh-day Adventist vegetarian. So I, I learned that there actually was more than even one other vegetarian dietitian on the planet. So um, within fairly short order, I met another one, Vasanto Molina, who became my writing partner. And, uh, and we began writing books together. And at the first book, we had a, a third author as well, uh, Victoria Harrison. Uh, but Vasanto and I went on and we've written um, now uh, many books together. I've, I'm on my nine, I th I'm ninth, I think she's on her 12th or 13th. We just are completing two more this year. Uh, and so we've been providing the resources we believe people need. And Vasanto is actually the senior author on the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uh, position statement on vegetarian nutrition as well. So we, and I was a past president of the vegetarian arm of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So we've been very active within our professions. And, and as for the shift, you know, at first, our peers were a little, you know, skeptical, uh, but they were inviting us to speak, to see what we had to say. And I can remember feeling that I, it's, it's, we've really arrived when a few years ago I was speaking at Dietitians of Canada and one of the, the leaders, the CEOs, uh, I was doing an interview like this, and after the interview, she came up to me with a little gift, and she said, I, I just want to tell you how proud you make me to be a dietitian. Thank you for the work you've been doing for the last many years. And it just, it, it just made me feel so validated, and, and it made me feel like what I've been doing is not just helping vegetarians, but helping my fellow colleagues as well, who are really coming along. And then my, my writing partner, Vasanto, this year won, I shouldn't say this year, last year, 2017, won the highest award offered to only one person a year uh, from Dietitians of Canada, the Riley Jeffs Memorial Lecture Award uh, for her work over you know the past 30 or 40 years. And so it's our, our profession, many people think dietitians are in the dark ages still, but it's, it's really quite extraordinary the number of new young dietitians that are graduating as plant-based uh, dietitians and also the number of 
older dietitians that are interested. I can remember once speaking at the American, you know, it was at that time the American Dietetic Association, but at the you know Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and I was in a room and speaking on vegetarian nutrition, and there was room for 900 people in in that room. There were so many people there that I, I bet we had 300 people on the floor and 200 people out the door. And I was told when I went to pick up my little CD of the lecture, it was the second biggest selling CD of the entire conference. And so there's interest. And we, as people that are especially interested in plant-based, uh, you know, a, a plant-based or more plant-based world, um, don't, don't discount uh, that uh, physicians, even mainstream and mainstream dietitians, are interested in this, you know, this option for people. It's, it's really happening. Mm -hmm.